as I travel around and speak about prophecy, this psalm does have some different interpretations around the place, okay? And there are questions on this psalm. So we want to try and nail it down absolutely in your mind so that you can be quite confident that Psalm 83 is actually about Armageddon and not about, uh, not about something else, as often been suggested. That's why, of course, Edom makes its appearance in Psalm 83 in verse 10. Uh, and so we'll, uh, we'll try and lead you towards that. I'm not sure 45 minutes is going to be enough, David, but we'll do our best. Okay, let's start with Brother Thomas. This is what he has to say in Eureka. This is the Logos edition, volume 5, page 48. He's talking about Babylon and Esau being identified here. He talks about the place. They are the place which caused Babylon the great city to fall. She falls because of her wickedness in church and state and of her sanguinary and merciless oppression of the saints and witnesses of Jesus and of all the Jews and others she has slain upon the earth. And he quotes, of course, Revelation 17, 6, 18, 24. Jeremiah, contemplating the terribleness of these latter days, says, Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble. Quotation out of Jeremiah 30, of course. But he shall be saved out of it, for it shall come to pass in that day, saith Yahweh Sabaoth, that I will break his yoke, that is, this is his brackets, the yoke of Esau's house from off thy neck, and will burst thy bonds, and strangers shall no more serve themselves of Jacob. Now, Edom is not actually mentioned, or Esau is not actually mentioned by name in, in uh, Jeremiah's dream, in Jeremiah chapter 30 and 31. But he's clearly there. Yahweh says in chapter 31, I will save Jacob out of the hand of him that is stronger than he. And guess what the context is? The return of Jacob from Haran back to the land of Canaan. Okay? So you know that Esau is referred to. So he's quite right in mentioning Esau's yoke. So we ask the question, who is Edom in the latter days? And some begin with a very flimsy premise. And this has misled people. In the last 40 years, it's misled people. This is their premise. This is a latter-day Christadelphian writer on the subject of Esau and Edom. First, it is taken as a conclusion requiring no proof. I like proof, by the way. <laughs> a conclusion requiring no proof that the prophecies of the last days concerning Edom are about the Arabs. Really? Since so many of the Arab tribes are descended from Esau and because ancient Edom is unquestionably Arab territory today. Well, let's make it very, very plain that there is no truth in that statement. Surely, I say, you must be kidding. <laughs> there is not one Arab living today that owes his origins to Esau. You know that? Edomites were totally and utterly eradicated from the earth in AD 70. They were gone. And that's exactly what God said would happen in Obadiah that there would not be one Edomite left. So there are no bloodline Edomites in the world today. That's the first point. And we'll point out that there are many Edomites in the world today, but they don't have bloodlines back to Esau. They are called Edom because of their hatred of the Jews, which was the main characteristic of Esau, who hated his brother Jacob. Esau was the first anti-Semite and becomes the type in Scripture of all anti-Semites in the latter days. Okay, so there's your first clue. So when this statement is made, it is a conclusion requiring no proof that the prophecies of the last days concerning Edom are about the Arabs. It's utter nonsense. And of course we learn a lesson from this. And this is the lesson. And I've been in many arguments where this has been the case. A premise is accepted and wrong conclusions are drawn. Never accept a premise blindly without checking its truth. Because, you see, if you accept a premise, then you have got to accept the conclusions. By normal logic, you can be taken down a path. It's like the clean flesh doctrine. If you accept the clean flesh doctrine assertion that Adam was created mortal, that is, he's already dying or subject to death, then you can prove the doctrine of substitute. You are locked in. You have no way of escape. All right? So you don't accept that. But you do not accept the premise without making sure it's true. So this is the first thing we learn. Brother Thomas had this right, of course. He understood exactly who Edom and Esau represented. 
He, he says this in Eureka, volume 5, <clears throat> page 50. Babylon and the goat nations, he says, Esau will have had the dominion over Jacob long enough, and the time will now have arrived to prove to mankind that there is a God that judgeth in the earth. Esau has lived by his sword, but not righteously. Now listen to these words here in yellow on the screen. This is about Esau. He crucified the king of Israel. Really? Persecuted and killed his brethren, corrupted the faith, trod underfoot the holy city forty and two months, and poured out the blood of Jacob like water upon the ground. But they who war against Zion and her son shall be as nothing, as a thing of naught. Now you can see what he means by Esau here. This, this is the power of Rome over its history. Crushed the Jewish people, right? spilled Jewish blood throughout the centuries. They, it was the Romans who crucified Christ. Okay, so he's talking about Rome. So this is about the anti-Semitism uh, of the Romans uh, against God's people. So here we've got, in our prophecies, use of this term Edom, just like we read in Psalm 83 verse 10. We're going to read it in Ezekiel 35. We're going to read it all over. Or in Isaiah 34, it's there because it's about the anti-typical Edom. And the anti-typical Edom relates to the political and ecclesiastical institutions of Gentile nations who oppose Christ at Armageddon and beyond. It's analogous to the Gogian Confederacy of Ezekiel 38. That's the political manifestation. Babylon the Greater Revelation 17 is the, is the ecclesiastical revelation or manifestation of Esau or Edom or the fourth beast of Daniel 7. And we know what the end of the fourth beast is, don't we? In Daniel chapter 7, we saw in verses 11 and 12 that the fourth beast is going to be utterly destroyed, abolished from the earth. Well, it was the fate of Esau and his nation. They were abolished from the earth in AD 70. They were completely wiped out as a people, just as Babylon the Great is going to be completely wiped out as a people. And as we're going to see, that's not the fate of the Arabs. Okay? That's not the biblical fate of the Arabs. But it is the fate of all anti-Semites. So this is why Edom is used in that regard. Edom does not apply to the Arab nations neighbouring Israel, for they find a privileged place in the kingdom alongside of Israel. You've got prophecies like Isaiah 60, verses 6 and 7, which we might refer to a little bit later on. We've had a look at Isaiah 21, verses 13 to 15, in our workshop a little while ago, remember that? They, have a, they, they dwell in the forest in Arabia. Okay? So they're there in the kingdom. And in Psalm 72, verse 9, it uses this phraseology of those who will be in the kingdom receiving the blessings of Christ's reign. They that dwell in the wilderness. All right. Well, who's that? That's the Arab people. So whereas Esau and Edom completely abolished, just like the fourth kingdom, the fourth empire of Daniel chapter 7, this is not the case with the Arab peoples. They have a wonderful future in the kingdom of God because they will submit to the rule of Christ. So let's take a step back, shall we? Let's go back to have a look at Abraham's family tree. So Abraham first has a child through Hagar, Genesis chapter 16. Ishmael becomes the father of the Arab nations. And then, of course, through Sarah, Isaac is born. <clears throat> And Isaac and Rebekah have Esau and Jacob who are born at the same time, although Esau is uh, the oldest by moments. Esau, of course, produces a nation called Edom, and Jacob produces a nation called Israel. That's all pretty simple, straightforward, isn't it? Okay, the sons of Ishmael and Esau in the future look like this. So Ishmael, there he is. Now let's have a look at Isaiah 60 and verse 7. Now Isaiah 60 is about the bright future of Zion. And you read in verse 1, Arise, shine, for thy light has come, and the glory of Yahweh has risen upon thee. Okay, And then you get to verse 6 and 7, and you read this. The multitude of camels shall cover thee, the dromedaries of Midian and Ephah, all they from Sheba shall come. Sheba, of course, is in the southern Arabian peninsula. They shall bring gold and incense, and they shall show forth the praises of Yahweh. All the flocks of Kedar. Now, Kedar, of course, yeah, comes from Ishmael. All the flocks of Kedar... Uh, shall be gathered together unto thee the rams of ne Nebajoth, that's another son of Ishmael. Okay, so here are the Arabs making sacrifices in the kingdom age. So it can't be from Esau because God made it very plain in Obadiah that Esau would be utterly and totally destroyed. There would be no descendants of Esau. Okay, so it's very, very plain that this 
this uh, assertion that Edom refers to the Arabs uh, could be, uh, it's not correct, and it can't be correct. In Isaiah 21, we uh, previously considered verse 14, Timar is mentioned there. He's another son of Ishmael, see? So uh, the Arabs will have a very bright future as next door neighbours to Israel in the kingdom of God. What about the other side of the equation? Well, as I said, Psalm 72 verse 9, they who dwell in the wilderness. This is the other side of the equation. Because the Edomites were predominant in the awful events that led to AD 70, between AD 66 and AD 70, there was a huge band of some 20,000 Edomites. Now, what happened in history was that when Nebuchadnezzar came and captured Judah, the Edomites rejoiced, and they were actually in league. Should we go to the book of Obadiah briefly? Just have a look at this history of Obadiah. The Edomites rejoiced at the destruction of Judah. They were, they were beside themselves with joy uh, at, at what had happened to, uh, to Judah. And we pick this message up, if you have a look, in verse 10 of Obadiah's prophecy. We told about the alliance that they had with the Babylonians a little earlier in this chapter uh, when we are told that, that they had they'd made their peace uh, with Nebuchadnezzar and they had become partners with him uh, and they, they watched with great joy the destruction of Judah. So verse 10, For thy violence against thy brother Jacob, shame shall cover thee, and thou shalt be cut off forever. In the day that thou stoodest on the other side, in the day that the strangers carried away captive his forces, and foreigners entered into his gates, and cast lots upon Jerusalem, even thou wast as one of them, but thou shouldest not have looked on the day of thy brother in the day that he became a stranger, neither shouldest thou have rejoiced over the children of Judah in the day of their destruction, neither shouldest thou have spoken proudly in the day of distress. And it goes on like that for some time. And then you get down to verse 15. For the day of Yahweh is near upon all the nations. Now, by all the nations meant all anti-Semitic nations, those who hate Israel. Okay, As thou hast done, it shall be done unto thee. Thy reward shall return upon thine own head. For as ye have drunk upon my holy mountain, so shall all the nations drink continually. Yea, they shall drink, they shall swallow down, and they shall be as though they had not been. That's their end. Total destruction. So anti-Semitic powers are doomed. And that's, this is why Edom is chosen to represent those anti-Semitic powers, because the first anti-Semite was Esau. He wanted to kill his brother Jacob. Remember that? Jacob has to flee to Haran to get away because his mother says, if you don't get out of here, you're going to die because Esau's going to kill you. So here is a twin brother who wants to kill his brother. So he's the first anti-Semite. And so that's why God takes him and uses him in that way. Now, we're going to read also, when we come to Psalm 83 and have a look at it, we're going to find Amalek is there. Well, guess who Amalek comes from? Right, He's a descendant of Esau another hater of Israel. Uh, and Amalek was utterly destroyed in Mount Seir. The record, have a look at the record of First of Chronicles chapter 4. Now God tried to get Saul to finish off the Amalekites, remember? It didn't work because he kept at least one of them alive. And we know that in the days of Esther there was an Amalekite called Haman, right, who did great damage. Another Jew hater, another anti-Semite. So what was the future that God had for Amalek? Well, it's the same as, as his forefather, Esau. So when you come to 1 Chronicles chapter 4, you read in verse 42, And some of them, even of the sons of Simeon, 500 men, went to Mount Seir, having for their captains Pelatiah and Neriah and Rephaiah and Aziel, the sons of Ishai, and they smote the rest of the Amalekites that were escaped and dwelt there unto this day. So the Amalekites came to an end at this time as a nation. They were, they were simply destroyed. And of course we know that they're still around in the latter days because in Numbers 24 you've got Balaam's prophecy concerning Agag. And Agag sets himself against Christ, we read in Numbers 24. Well, Agag is rendered in the Septuagint as Gog. All right? So Agag equals Gog. And of course we know Gog's going to be there. But it's not, Gog's not a descendant of the Amalekites. The reason they're given the name Gog or Agag is because of their attitude towards God's people. They are anti-Semitic, right? which is why, by the way, that uh, Jeremy Corbyn, the opposition leader in Britain, won't become Prime Minister. You know why? He's an anti-Semite. 
Yeah, he got no hope. If he beca becomes Prime Minister, he's not going to be very, there for very long. Being an anti-Semite doesn't get you very far. All right, history pre testifies to that. So here we've got the end of Edomites. So Esau represents anti-Semitic nations. By the way, Amalek was the first of the nations to attack Israel in the wilderness, we are told in Numbers chapter 24 and verse 20. Why did we deal with that? Well, because you find the same thing in Psalm 83. So this is the psalm we've read this morning. So I want you to come along to Psalm 83. You find Nebuchadnezzar's image in Psalm 83. Now, Brother David, when he began the reading of this psalm in verse 1, correctly read the first God, G-O-D, as Elohim, and the second one as Ael. Why would God change that? Why would he not use Elohim again? Well, because, you see, when you come to the last verse of this chapter, you have in verse 18 another title of God, that men may know that thou whose name alone is Yahweh art the most high over all the earth. The most high here is the Hebrew word Aelion, which you can see in green. So in verse 1, we have Aeol. In verse 18, the last verse, we have Aelion. And it is a simple fact, brothers and sisters, whenever you find that title, which is first used in Genesis chapter 14, the subject matter of the context is drawn from Genesis chapter 14. So what, what is Genesis chapter 14 about? Well, it's about Armageddon. We're going to spend a few minutes on that uh, here this morning. It's about Armageddon. We're going to see that Psalm 83, in fact, is an Armageddon psalm. And there are many, many proofs of that, only a few of them which we'll deal with today. So this title of the Almighty, Ael Aelion, first occurs in Genesis chapter 14. Now you may wish to sort of pop something in Psalm 83 because we're going to be back here shortly and, and have also open Genesis chapter 14. The context of Genesis chapter 14 uh, is the same as the context of Psalm 83. In Psalm 83 verses 2 to 5 we have a confederacy of nations determined to destroy Israel. In verses 9 to 12 of the psalm, we have a reference to Gideon's overthrow of the Midianites and to the destruction of Jabin and Sisera, both of them types of Armageddon, drawn from the book of Judges. And then we have in Psalm 83, ten nations listed, representing all nations, because ten is the number of ordinal perfection, it stands for all. These are the all nations who come against Israel uh, in the latter days, as we read in Zechariah 14 verse 2, and Joel 3 verse 2. And the focus in the psalm is on peoples and nations, not on territory so much, as you can pick up from verse 2 and verse 9. But we'll come back to the psalm in a minute. I want you to come to, as I said, Genesis chapter 14. It's the first cameo in the Bible of the kingdom of God. And what, of course, will lead to the establishment of the kingdom of God is Armageddon. So let's see if we can explore this for a while. Let's just let's summarise the content of Genesis chapter 14. Now, if I didn't like reading names, and I wanted to sort of just abbreviate things a little, I could read verse 1 this way. And it came to pass in the days of these kings. If I had a problem with the name Amraphel, or Kidaleomo, for example, I might just say, in the days of these kings. That's exactly what Daniel chapter 2, verse 44 says. In the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. That kingdom will not be left to other people. In verses 2 to 7 of Genesis chapter 14, we've got the northern confederacy invading the land. And this is clearly a type of Gog coming down upon the land in the latter days. In verses 8 to 12 of Genesis 14, we've got a southern confederacy who are defeated by the northern confederacy. And Lot and his family are taken into captivity. Now Lot, of course, was a Hebrew. He was the, the nephew of Abraham. So he belongs to Abraham's family. When Gog comes into the land in the latter days, brothers and sisters, the one thing that they will do, we read from, Gen from uh, Zechariah 14, is that they will take a lot of Jews into captivity. That's because there's 1.4 million Russian Jews in Israel who came into the land in the 1990s who in fact are the brains trust, or at least they were the brains trust of Russia, which is why Israel has become the, the, the leader in technology in the world. They've got all these brains that came... Jewish brains who came from Russia. What would you do if you were Gog and came into the land? I think I'd take a few home, wouldn't you? Yeah, and that's exactly what they will do. Well, that's what happens here. In Genesis chapter 14, Lot and his family are taken into captivity. In verses 13 to 16, Abraham puts together an army, an army consisting of home-born Hebrews and converted Gentiles. 
you know the record. Just have a quick look at the end of verse 13. It says, uh, let's pick this up. At the end of verse 13 it says about uh, brother of Eshcol, uh, Mamre, the Amorite, brother of Eshcol and brother of Anah. In actual fact, if you look up the Hebrew, it literally reads brother Eshcol and brother Ana. And then it says, these were confederate. And that word confederate is two Hebrew words, Balaam, Bereth. It means the possessors of a covenant with Abraham. Now that wasn't a covenant about setting up an ice cream parlour in Hebron, was it? It wasn't a business covenant. He had converted them to the truth. He had the same covenant with them that you and I have got with God. Covenant through conviction and the promises made to Abraham. So these were converted Gentiles. And of course they go out and they defeat the northern confederacy and they rescue Lot. It's a type of Christ and the saints in the latter days. Defeating Gog upon the mountains of Israel and rescuing Abraham's brethren. In verses 17 to 20, Abraham meets Melchizedek, king of Salem. And there's a beautiful fellowship meal held, just as we will have a little later on today. And of course, we can see that. It's a type of Christ, Melchizedek, the type of our Lord Jesus Christ who will bring out bread and wine in a fellowship meal. Then in verses 21 to 24, Abraham repudiates the king of Sodom's offer of wealth and makes a, a vow before his God. So that's the content of Genesis chapter 14. So who are the players here? Well, this is how it unfolds. We've got this northern confederacy coming down upon the land. They defeat the southern confederacy here. They take captives and away they go. Abraham and his company follow them up to a place called Dan. Now, in fact, the place wasn't called Dan until Judges chapter 18. But it is called Dan in Genesis 14. I wonder why. Well, because, you see, it tells us that this is about Armageddon. Kidaleoma and those kings that are with him represent Gog and his confederates. Lot, whose name means veiled, very appropriately, represents Israel after the flesh in their blindness. The king of Sodom represents the corrupt, effete and prosperous anti-Gog powers who will be defeated. Abram and his servants represent Christ and the saints in warlike manifestation. And Melchizedek represents Christ as king priest in the kingdom. And it's just a fascinating detail. Come back to verse 1 of Genesis 14. That when you look at the four kings, how many parts are there to Nebuchadnezzar's image, brothers and sisters? Four. When you look at the four kings, guess who's at the top? He's not the leader of the invasion, but he's the head. He's at the top. Yeah, here he is. Amraphel, king of Shinar. His name means powerful people. He's the king of Babylon. What's the head of Nebuchadnezzar's image? The real thinking power. Babylon. Yes. Now, who leads this invasion? Well, we read of the next king. He doesn't lead it. Ariok, king of Elisar. You know where Elisar is? It's actually where Iran is today. Yeah. Well, what's that? That's Medo-Persia, isn't it? That's the silver of Nebuchadnezzar's image. So who comes next? Kidaleoma. Guess what his name means? A handful of sheaves. And he's the leader of the confederacy. And he's destroyed in a valley in a place called Dan which is the meaning of Armageddon, a heap of sheaves in a valley for judgment. That's what Armageddon means. Now, you can look this up for yourself. If that's not a type of the latter days, then I've never seen one. If this is not about Nebuchadnezzar's image being destroyed, I've never seen one. All right? So you don't have to go to Daniel 2 to find Nebuchadnezzar's image. It's in Genesis chapter 14. This word Armageddon, a heap of sheaves in a valley for judgment, Precipitated by Gog, the leader of a confederacy of nations in alliance with Babylon the Great, or Rome, coming down upon the mountains of Israel. So why is Kidaleoma number three, do you think? Well, what's the, what was the third empire? The Greeks. Where will Gog begin his advance upon the Middle East? From Constantinople. If you had to choose a metal for Constantinople, what would you choose? I'd choose two. Because, you see, it was once the capital of the Roman world. And the symbol would be iron, wouldn't it? But the religion of Constantinople is the Greek Orthodox and the Russian Orthodox. What metal would you choose for them? Brass. That's why when the Babylonian tree was cut down, brothers and sisters, in Daniel chapter 4, it was banded with a single band of brass and iron. 
And in the record of Daniel, when brass and iron are used together, it's all about religion. And the Gogian invasion of the land is all about religion. They're coming to take the holy sites. They're coming to destroy Israel. They're coming to do things that have to do with religion. Yeah, it's all there. Now, if you need any final proof, this is about Armageddon, just have a look at verse 13 of Genesis 14. Verse 13 says, And there came one that had escaped and told Abram the Hebrew. Now, that's all I want. It's the first occasion where you read the term Hebrew. Or yes, you read a name like Eber, which comes from Abar and so on. You don't ever read the word Hebrew until Genesis chapter 14 and verse 13. Why is that significant? Well, where's the last place in the Bible that you read the word Hebrew? It's on the screen. Revelation 16 and verse 16. You know what it says? Yeah. And he gathered them into a place called in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. It's like the Spirit saying, yeah, you got it right. Genesis 14 is about Armageddon. It's the Spirit's imprimatur on that, brothers and sisters. There is no doubt that this context in Genesis 14 is about Armageddon. Like Kedileoma, Gog is victorious and carries away many of the Jews into captivity along with the spoils of war. Now, no wonder when you come to Psalm 83 that reference is made to Ael Aelion because if you're still in Genesis 14, have a look at verse 18. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine and was the priest of the Most High God. There's our title, Ael, Aelion. And it's used, as you would appropriately accept, four times. The number of God manifestation and righteousness in the Word of God. Four times here of the 48 or so occurrences in the Old Testament. And he blessed him in verse 19 and said, Blessed be Abraham of the Most High God, Ael, Aelion, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thine hand. And again in verse 22, Abraham says, I have lifted up my hand unto Yahweh, the Most High God. So it's repeated over and over again, four times. Whenever you meet that title in the Old Testament and in the New, because it has a New Testament equivalent, Pupsistos is the Greek word used for alien in the New Testament, and you find it in Luke chapter 1. The promise of Gabriel to Mary when he said, The child that's going to be born from you shall be the son of the highest. He shall be the son of the highest. Whenever you meet that word in the New Testament, it's actually the title Aelion from Genesis chapter 14. And the subject's going to be the same. Every time you meet this word, this title, if you look at the surrounding context, it's drawn from Genesis chapter 14, which is the way the, the scripture works. So we can uh, come back, I think, to Psalm 83 now. We've got the roots of Psalm 83, which is an Armageddon psalm. So I'm going to read it again from verse 2. They have taken, sorry, for lo thine enemies, make a tumult, and they that hate thee have lifted up their head. And that's what I said. In the King James it says, the head. It should read, their head. Do you know what the word head is in Hebrew? Rosh. They've lifted up their rosh. They have taken crafty counsel against thy people and consulted against thy hidden ones. They have said, and this of course is the policy of Iran today, it was the policy, the very clear policy of Ahmadinejad, the former president of Iran, come and let us cut them off from being a nation, that the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance. That's the policy of Iran and those who are supporters of Iran. For they have consulted together with one consent. They are confederate against thee. And then we've got a list of the confederates. And it lines up with Nebuchadnezzar's image. So who's the first in the list? Well, of course, the tabernacles of Edom. Well, we know who Edom represents. Edom represents Babylon the Great, the latter days, the the, the most anti-Semitic power on earth. So clearly, Edom's got to be there, doesn't it? So here we've got Babylon, the head of the image. Well, who comes next? The Ishmaelites. Well, they're Muslims, aren't they? Where do you find Muslims? From Syria across to Pakistan. They're all Muslim. And they'll be part of the Confederacy because that was part of the Medo-Persian Empire. But read on. Of Moab and the Hagarenes, into verse 7. Gebel and Ammon and Amalek. Amalek was the son of Esau, you'll remember. The Philistines were the inhabitants of Tyre. Philistines, Palestinians, yep. 
Tyre, Hezbollah, yep, you got it. So what we have here, of course, is Nebuchadnezzar's image. And down here in verse 8, who do we meet? It says Asser in the King James. You know who that is? It should be Assyria. And the, the power of Gog is called the latter-day Assyrian all through the book of Isaiah and in the book of Micah. Okay? When the Assyrian shall come into our land. Micah chapter 5. So, we know what this is about. This is about the invasion of Israel in the latter days. And it has an outcome. And the outcome is the destruction of that power upon the mountains of Israel. So verse 8 says, Assyria also is joined with them. They have holpen the children of Lot. And by the children of Lot is meant those false religions. For from Lot came Moab and Ammon. They were, of course, born in very uh, difficult circumstances where his daughters uh, did, uh, did something quite wrong to their father. And out comes these illegitimate children, okay? just like the churches that support the papacy and will support this invasion are illegitimate. So you see how accurate this really is. So having that then as a bit of a basis, we can come to Isaiah 63. Now this is the companion chapter in the book of Isaiah to Isaiah 34. And we spent quite a bit of time uh, yesterday dealing with Isaiah 34. We're going to spend just a little bit of time here in Isaiah 63. Now the title of our class this morning is the first words of verse 1. Who is this that cometh from Edom? But you really need to get the context straight. This is preceded, of course, by Isaiah 62. And if you have a look at Isaiah 62, verses 10 to 12, you'll see that this is a call for Israel to prepare to receive its Messiah. Verse 10, Isaiah 62. Go through, go through the gates, prepare ye the way of the people. Cast up, cast up the highway, which is sort of about like building a highway. Gather out the stones, lift up a standard for the people. Behold, Yahweh hath proclaimed unto the end of the world, Say ye to the daughter of Zion, Behold, thy salvation cometh. Behold, his reward is with him and his work before him. And they shall call them the holy people, the redeemed of Yahweh. And thou shalt be called, sought out, a city not forsaken. Because, of course, today you could say they were. So this is a call for them, the people of Israel, to prepare to receive their Messiah. And then the call comes, the question is asked, well, who is this? It's coming from Edom. Okay, so we've got to find out what this is about. It's followed this by Isaiah 63, verses 7 to 19, where Yahweh's mercy returns to Israel, who plead for forgiveness. This is clearly, therefore, post-Armageddon. Okay, so we get the context straight. Now, you can just cast your eyes down Isaiah 63 from 7 to 19, and you'll see the kind of languages here. Verse 17, for example. O Yahweh, why hast thou made us to err from thy ways, and harden our heart from thy fear? Return for thy servant's sake the tribes of thine inheritance. It's a call. It's a call to, for God to redeem his people, the natural people of Abraham. So that's your context, before and after. So let's explore the first six verses of Isaiah 63. Clearly, therefore, a reference to the events of Armageddon and beyond, especially beyond. Now, Brother Thomas said in Elpis Israel, page 445, that the Jews have returned in ignorance of the Messiahship of Jesus. Hence it is they who inquire, who is this that cometh from Edom? This is what the Jews are asking. Got that? Christ and the saints will come into the land from Sinai, via Mount Paran, the Arabah, and Seir, the land, of course, of Esau. So having been glorified down here, the time has come, they make their way up, there's certain things that have happened, they've subdued the Arabs in this area, they've begun the, the process of smiting and healing Egypt, and then they're going to make their way up here to come in from the east like the rising sun. And of course, when they arrive, as Zechariah 14 says, at the Mount of Olives, his feet shall touch the Mount of Olives in that day, there's the great earthquake precipitated of Armageddon, which completely destroys the infrastructure of the world, reshapes the land, if not the earth, and of course provides the basis upon which a new beginning can be made. Now, Edom and Bosra that are found here in Isaiah 63, so let's read verse 1, the Edom and the Bosra that we have here are as they are in Isaiah 34. They are typical names. 
Who is this that cometh from Edom with dyed garments from Bosra? This that is glorious in his apparel, travelling in the greatness of his strength. I that speak in righteousness, mighty to save, is the response. Well, of course, this is our Lord Jesus Christ. So if this is not a literal Edom and Bosra, although, of course, Christ and the saints will literally pass through Edom and past Bosra, what does it represent? Just as in Isaiah 34, it actually represents Babylon the Great. Now, we need, of course, to prove that, and that's what we're going to set out to do. Let's just be clear, though, about the deliverance of Jacob. There are two stages to the deliverance of Jacob, Jacob being the name for the whole nation. Christ will save the tents of Judah first, we read in Zechariah 12, verse 7. He will save the tents of Judah first immediately after Armageddon. So two-thirds of the Jews in the land will perish. The remaining third, the remnant, will be redeemed. It will be a process of some little time, but that will happen. That's what is happening here in stage one. Stage two, Elijah will lead the second exodus. Now, in actual fact, the second exodus begins with his warning of the Jews that they're going to get the sign of Armageddon. So this is, we believe, three and a half years prior to Armageddon, that work begins. But the second exodus takes as long as the first one. We find that from Micah chapter 7 and verse 15. It's the same length as the first exodus, 40 years. So it's these Jews, as we saw yesterday, who are coming back under Elijah, that are used as the weapon against Babylon the Great, now established in Central Europe. That period, therefore, when Israel is used as the weapon against Babylon the Great is the actual treading of the winepress of the wrath of God. We read about the treading of the winepress, that's when that happens. And Israel is the vehicle to perform it. Now you saw this chart yesterday, it should be fairly familiar to you now. You've got the, the pattern of Roman Catholic resistance to Christ. They crash here, they, they regain their power, Rome's destroyed, they regain their power. But at this stage of events, it's in this period that there's the treading of the winepress of the wrath of God. It lasts for 40 years, but the most intense is that hour of judgment that we spoke of yesterday. The last 30 years. So let's come back here to Isaiah 63. Now I want you to follow me as we read down. I'm going to do some changing here of the translation. You can check this out for yourself. It says in verse 2, Wherefore art thou red in thine apparel, and thy garments like him that treadeth in the wine vat? And Joel 3.13 is very helpful there. And then it says, I have, notice the tense, I have trodden the wine press alone. Now that's the correct tense. What follows, I don't know why the translators didn't follow that, but what follows is consistent with the first words of verse 3. <coughs> and of the peoples, that's a plural word, it doesn't, it's not a reference to the saints, because the saints will be with Christ, and of the peoples, meaning the nations, there was none with me, for I trod, it's in the past tense in the Hebrew, I trod them in mine anger, and trampled them, so I put a D on the end of the word trample, I trampled them in my fury, and their blood is sprinkled upon my garments, it's past tense, and I have stained all my raiment. Okay, this is, this is stuff that's already happened. It's done. For in the day of vengeance was, the, the day of vengeance was in mine heart, and the year of my redeemed is come. And I looked, and there was none to help, and I wondered that there was none to uphold. Therefore mine own arm brought salvation unto me, and my fury it upheld me. Notice the tense again, past. And it, so it should be in verse 6. I trod down the peoples, plural, in mine anger, and make them drunk, made them drunk in my fury, and I brought down their strength to the earth. So I've given you the correct translation, it's past tense. This is talking about events that are over. So the question, who is this that comes from Edom, is not about Christ coming from Sinai with some kind of conflict in Bosra and he turns up at the Mount of Olives and they say, oh, why are you, why are you covered in blood? Not about that. It's about 40 years later. 40 years later. when that question is asked by the Jews, both in the land and redeemed by Elijah. You're covered in blood for I've done this and I've done that. I've finished the job against Edom. 
Yeah, and the Edom here, of course, quite clearly is the same Edom everywhere else in prophecy. Babylon the Great. People, as I said, is plural here. You can add an S safely. The RV, the revised version, does that. It refers to the nations. The blood on the garments is a symbol for the conquest in war. And the context of Revelation 19, which we'll go to in a moment, is very, very important in that regard, as is Song of Solomon 3 verse 6. These and many other passages show Christ will not in fact be alone in his conquest of the nations. He will have his saints with him, or at least saints will be deployed in various places, but he will have some of his saints with him in this work. And of course it will be Elijah and the saints who shepherd Israel through Europe. They will bring back the nation of Israel and they'll have to fight their way back through the land of Edom, as Brother Thomas said in Eureka, Babylon 8. Now, while we're in Isaiah 63, we need proof that what I've said is correct. Let's have a look at verses, we'll read it from verse 11. Isaiah 63, verse 11. Then he remembered the days of old, Moses and his people, saying, Where is he that brought them up out of the sea with the shepherd of his flock? Where is he that put his Holy Spirit within him? It's a reference to what God did for Israel when he brought them out of Egypt, brought them through the Red Sea. So we read in verse 12, that led them by the right hand of Moses with his glorious arm, dividing the water before them, that's the Red Sea, to make himself an everlasting name. Now all of that's very straightforward, isn't it? But then you read this. This is a curiosity. Then you read in verse 13, that led them through the deep as an horse in the wilderness, that they should not stumble. Now, if I was to ask you, brothers and sisters, what four-legged beast is deployed in the word of God as a symbol for the nation of Israel? It's not a horse. It's the ass, the male ass, the camor. Okay? Everybody knows that. So why does God use horse? Well, you're going to see why he uses horse, because Isaiah 63 is actually the roots of Revelation chapter 19. That's what it is. It's the roots of Revelation chapter 19 and in fact 14. Now I want to just take you through a couple of passages here. You see the ones on the screen there? We're going to come to them in a minute. But have a look with me at Zechariah 10 and verse 3. This is what I love about the scripture. It is perfectly consistent and harmonious. But there are times when you read something you think, that doesn't sit well. That's not what we normally read. You're going to read of a four-legged beast that's a symbol of Israel. It's always the ass, but not here. Why? Well, you see, the ass is a gentle beast of burden. The horse is a vehicle of warfare. The horse is about war. That's why in Zechariah chapter 10, you read this in verse 3. Mine anger was kindled against the shepherds, and I punished the goats, for Yahweh of armies hath visited his flock, the house of Judah, and hath made them as his goodly horse in the battle. See, it's that kind of language. So Isaiah 63 is the roots of Revelation. We can safely leave Isaiah now and come to Revelation chapter 14, which we were here, of course, yesterday in Revelation 14. And the subject of Revelation 14, from verse 18 onwards, is the treading of the winepress of the wrath of God. So let's read down from verse 18 of Revelation 14. And another angel came out from the altar. This one follows the angel of the harvest in verse 15. So you've got Armageddon, Armageddon, the harvest of the earth in verse 15. And you've got now the treading of the winepress in Revelation 14 verse 18. He cried with a loud cry to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. So here's your treading out of the winepress of the wrath of God. This is about the destruction of Babylon the Great. Now look at verse 20. And the winepress was trodden without the city and blood came out of the winepress even unto the horse bridles by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs which of course is the apocalyptic way of saying 40 years. You've got the square root principle of verse 1, 144,000. Okay. 144,000 is 12 times 12, the square root principle. It comes from Revelation 7. And the same principle is used at the end of the chapter. 40 times 40 is 1,600. And God puts it that way because he doesn't want the simple who don't want to explore the word to understand. You've actually got to think about it. 
And if you do think about it, it's simple. This lines up with Micah 7 verse 15. The second exodus of Israel will be 40 years. The treading out of the winepress of the wrath of God is 40 years. Who does that work? Israel returning under Elijah. And they're the horse. That's the horse of Isaiah 63, 13. The vehicle of warfare. Okay? And it says the blood, and this is not literal, this is symbolic, isn't it? It says the blood is up to the horse bridles by the space of 1,600 furlongs or 40 years. In other words, there's a treading out over that whole time. Blood to the horse bridles, horse being Israel, the instrument of war. That's, of course, just one reference to the horse. Come to Revelation chapter 19. In verse 11 of Revelation 19, we read this. Now, this language is clearly drawn from Isaiah 63. Without that, just have a quick look at verse 15. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword. No, I should actually go back a bit further. I should go back to verse 13. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. That's exactly what Isaiah 63 said, remember? He's clothed in a vesture dipped in blood. Verse 15. Out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, and with that he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. Yeah, we know what that. Straight out of Isaiah 63. So is the horse. Look at verse 11 of Revelation 19. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. Now this is the beauty of Scripture. You don't need to guess as to what that represents. Because the same verse tells you what it represents. Let's read on. Behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness. White. He doth judge and make war. Horse. See, the very same verse tells you what the white horse represents. It's righteous warfare. And the horse here, of course, represents Israel, who will be the instrument of divine judgment. What a picture that is. But see, in Isaiah 63, if you misread it, you can think that it was Christ alone who was doing this work. That he doesn't have his saints with him. But he does. Because in Revelation 19, we see them. We see them in verse 14. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses. So who are these people who, like their Lord, are riding on white horses? Riding on Israel, so to speak. Well, they're clothed in fine linen, white and clean, we are told in verse 14. And if you go back to verse 8, you find out who they are. In verse 8, we read this, of the bride of Christ. The marriage of the Lamb is referred to in verse 7. And the bride of Christ is described this way in verse 8. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteous nesses, as it should read. It's a plural word. It's not about their imputed righteousness. They need that. But it's actually about what they did with their lives. It's the righteous nesses, or as Brother Thomas translates it, the righteous acts of the saints. That's why they're there, as immortals, riding on white horses, so to speak, in the symbolic language of the apocalypse. They're clean and white garment, evidence that not only were they forgiven their sins, but they actually did something in gratitude because of it. They developed the righteousness of God in their life. There are two forms of righteousness that we must have, brothers and sisters. There's the imputed righteousness that we recall in our memorial meeting. We all need that, a covering for sins where God can impute righteousness on the basis of faith. But we've got to have more than that. We have to have what this describes, manifested righteousness, a way of life that reveals that the truth has taken hold of our life and that we do in fact follow the one that will be seen in that day riding a white horse so that we too can ride white horses. That's the message that comes through. What a wonderful vision that is. And now we know, of course, why Edom's there, why Bosra's there. Bosra is a typical name for Rome. Just watch this develop in front of your eyes. Here is the magnificent vision of the rainbowed angel of Revelation chapter 10. And there we've got our Lord Jesus Christ surrounded by a white cloud, the symbol of a multitude who are in righteousness, white righteousness. And this we see at the end of their career. That's the important thing to remember when you read Revelation chapter 10, verses 1 and 2. We're not in the march. It's gone. 40 years. Oh yes, the feet are still on fire, but they're stationary. 
He has set his right foot upon the sea. That's the Mediterranean region. And his left foot on the earth, the Roman region. There's your two phases. Harvest of the earth, vintage of the earth. But he's no longer marching because that is what the open scroll in his hand represents. When you open a scroll, it's because what's written in it has actually been fulfilled. Won't it be terrific if we're there on that day? Forty years beyond Armageddon. That's where I want to be, brothers and sisters. That's where you want to be. But it does depend on us making sure that we're ready for that day. Shall we give Brother Thomas the last word here? He writes this in volume 5, page 48 of Eureka. I'm going to take you to where he's referring to very briefly. I think we have time to do that. He writes, They are the plagues which cause Babylon the great city to fall. She falls because of her wickedness in church and state and of her sanguinary and merciless oppression of the saints and witnesses of Jesus and of all the Jews and others she has slain upon the earth. Jeremiah, contemplating the terribleness of these latter days, says, Alas, for that day is great so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. For it shall come to pass in that day, saith Yahweh Sabaoth, that I will break his yoke, that is, the yoke of Esau's house, from off thy neck, and will burst thy bonds. And strangers shall no more serve themselves of Jacob. You know where he's coming from. It's Jeremiah. Come to Jeremiah 30 and 31. And this is where we're going to conclude this morning. Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 4, through to 31, 26, is a dream. You may wish to take note of that fact, and the reason for this is that Jeremiah has been confronted back in chapter 23, and just before 30, in chapter 29, by false dreamers. Now, I'm not going to go into all of that, but have a look at verse 24 of Jeremiah 29. Thus shalt thou also speak to Shemaiah the Nehelamite. Now, in the margin of my Bible, for Nehelamite, he's got dreamer. You look up the Hebrew word, it means he of the dream. He's just one of many false prophets that Jeremiah had to confront. And Jeremiah was overwhelmed by these false prophets. They were far more numerous, they had far more clout in the kingdom than he did. He was overwhelmed by them, like we feel sometimes, we're overwhelmed. So God gives him a dream. And we know that. If you turn to chapter 31, verse 26, 31, 26, we read this. Upon this, he says, I awaked and beheld, and my sleep was sweet unto me. Yeah, why wouldn't it be? This is a magnificent dream. It starts in chapter 30, verse 4. It goes through to chapter 31, verse 6. Now, this is the parable. It's all based upon Jacob's life, this dream. It's the parable of Israel. Jacob was forced from his home by the hatred of Esau. He laboured under oppression in the house of Laban, but prospered. He returned to the land with anxiety because of Esau. His name changed and greatly was greatly humbled before being redeemed by God from the hand of Esau. He settled in the land of promise in peace. That's the basis of Jeremiah's dream in Jeremiah 30 and 31. The entire context. It's a fabulous piece of scripture. And of course, there's a similarity between Jeremiah's dream and the dream of Jacob in Genesis 28, upon which this whole dream of Jeremiah is based. Jacob, of course, fleeing in fear of Esau, who was stronger than he. Jeremiah was confronted by false prophets supported by the king. Jacob dreamed of a staircase to heaven. Jeremiah dreamed of Israel's redemption. Jacob had the promise confirmed. Jeremiah sees the promise finally fulfilled. Jacob was assured of protection, and in Jeremiah's dream he saw Jacob redeemed. Jacob was awestruck by the divine presence of the angels. Jeremiah awakens with joy and sweetness. Jacob built a memorial, and in in Jeremiah's dream, Yahweh is memorialized. And Jacob, at the end of Genesis 28, made a vow. It's exactly what we read of Christ doing here in Jeremiah 30. Have a look at Jeremiah 30 and verse 21. And it says in the King James, and their nobles shall be of themselves. That's a a poor translation. The RSV is better. The RSV says, and their prince. It's about Christ. Their prince shall be of themselves. And their governor. See, that's rendered by the RSV as ruler, which is its meaning. So their prince shall be of themselves, and their governor shall proceed from the midst of them. Of course, it's a reference to Christ. 
And I will cause him to draw near, says God, and he shall approach unto me. For who is this that engaged his heart to approach unto me? Now that word engaged is the Hebrew word arab. It means to break, to intermix. Rotherham translates it pledged. And here was our Lord Jesus Christ who pledged himself. He made a vow. Yeah, exactly like Jacob did at the end of Genesis 28. So these two dreams, dream of Jacob, dream of Jeremiah, very much the same.